Hello everyone, just a quick announcement before we get into this week's episode that we only have three weeks left of our vampire series. Can you believe it? So as ever, as we draw this series to a close, I would love to hear from you guys. Our last episode of the series just before Christmas is going to be a mailbag episode and I want to read some of your feedback. So please do write in to me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. Let me know your thoughts on this vampire series, some highlights, some lowlights, uh, anything that that I've missed any major omissions and I'm also looking to count down the listeners top 10 vampire movies so please also send me your top 10 vampire movies of all time that's evolution of horror at gmail.com to live long they have no use for your song you're dead you're dead you're dead you're dead and out of this world Back in 2005, New Zealand writers and comedians Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement made a short film called What We Do in the Shadows, a comedy about a group of vampires in a house share in Wellington. Nearly a decade later, after achieving major success with their HBO show Flight of the Concords, Clement and Waititi were able to adapt this short film into a feature. Awaken! Awakey, wakey! 2014's What We Do in the Shadows lovingly used classic vampire tropes and drew on some of Clements and Waititi's favourite vampire movies, including The Lost Boys and Bram Stoker's Dracula, but it also mixed in mockumentary comedy and became a huge cult success, eventually spawning a spin-off TV show. My name is Colin Robinson and I am what's known as a psychic vampire or energy vampire. Which is now considered by many to be superior to the film and one of the most beloved vampire properties of the 21st century. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the vampire and we discuss Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clements' What We Do in the Shadows. I don't give a fuck. His name was Mike. Fucking Mike. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our eighth series exploring the evolution of the vampire movie and this is part 24. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 Patreon. Patreon subscriber Jamie B. And in this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we're going to be talking all things what we do in the shadows. So in the first half of the episode, or maybe the first third of the episode, we'll be talking about the original feature film from 2014. Then for the rest of the episode, we will be talking in spoilerific detail about all four seasons of of the brilliant television show. Now, as with all television shows, it's it's difficult. We don't cover anything in depth, but we do kind of skip through it from season to season and we list some of our favourite episodes. So if you don't want to be spoiled on the TV show, go and give it a watch before you listen to our discussion. So joining me to discuss all things what we do in the shadows, not only a very good friend of this pod, but one of my very favourite podcasters, uh, co-host of my favourite horror podcast, The Faculty of Horror, which started 10 years ago this month. It's Alex West. Hello, Alex. Welcome back. Hi, Mike. So good to see you again. It's so lovely to have you back. And I guess I just want to start by saying congratulations. 10 years of Faculty of Horror. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. December 2022. uh, So next month at the time we're recording this is going to be our 10 year anniversary of doing the podcast. So amazing. We're really excited. It's uh, somehow feels like no time at all, but also all of the time. Yeah. I bet. Well, we were just talking about before we started recording, right, that you guys actually went back and re-listened to your first ever episode recently, which is how was that? Because 
I really struggle to listen to my own old episodes um, and a lot's changed since 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot changes. Some of it, like some of the core stuff is still there. Um, So I'm not as probably embarrassed as I thought I would be, but it is a very sobering thing to do. Um, And it's funny. And I think it was a good exercise for us because a lot of people, if they do hear about us, they will start with the first episode. Yeah. So I feel like we're always grappling with those like, that was me in stasis 10 years ago. <laughs> I know. And this is me now. Uh, but also, like, you guys were some of the first people to do this th- this whole thing, right, as well. Like, the, the, in, even just the world of podcasting must have been so different when you guys started in 2012. Yeah. I mean, I like to think we really invented the podcast. <laughs> you did, just, right? You did. Yeah, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, yeah. you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were there were people doing it, but it was before. I always say like our podcast started pre serial. Serial was I think mid to late 2013, yeah. and we were late 2012. And I remember when I started, and I was telling people, you know, we were doing it, and they didn't even know how to listen to podcasts. Mm. They didn't understand what it was. And now, like my friends who still listen to my podcast, thankfully, they like more podcasts than I do. They're, they're so into it. They're so invested. And I think it's great because it's just been this real, like kind of punk rock DIY community thing that has risen up and it's been so great to see. And now, you know, some people, some very upsetting right-wing idiots get paid hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. Yeah. I know. Some of us do it for love. <laughs> right? Exactly. I know. <laughs> God. Yeah. How a, a lot's changed. Yeah. Right? But it's a, it's a great thing to be involved with. And it's been so wonderful. Like I think back and, you know, the people we've gotten to meet and the listeners we've gotten to interact with and like getting to know you, it's, it's all just been like ultimately really lovely. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, even from my experience, I've done this for way less time than you have, but the thing that was the big shock to me in a really pleasant way was it wasn't just about making a podcast it was about meeting such a huge community of people like getting to meet you people like Stacey but also people that were never on my radar who I now consider some of my best friends who came along to my wedding you know I met them all through my podcast it's a great way to find your community and and to meet like-minded people and I think because especially like there are so many iterations of like horror podcasts for example or you know if you, you know Take yeah. your pick of what your interest is. There's something out there for you and you can find the tone and the texture that you like and then, you know, chase that dragon. So good. So um, in this current series, obviously, we're talking about vampires. Um, let me start off by asking you, wh- what are your thoughts generally? You guys have covered quite a lot of vampire stuff in the past on Faculty of Horror. But would you say that you're generally a fan of, of vampire movies? I don't know if it's like vampire specific. I love their constant regeneration. Yeah. I, I'm always, I think, excited to see what the next thing that they're going to do is and how they're going to be utilized next, uh, because I find that to be really interesting and I think tells us a lot about where we are in our storytelling and our narratives as a culture. So I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, I, I grew up watching like the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie and then the TV show. So it definitely had kind of a formative, like, sexy dangerous energy to Mm, it mm -hmm. um and you know then getting to know um you know other major iterations of it has been um like just vampires themselves and discovering the different lores and how they're used i always thought was really really cool yeah and actually somebody made the really good point last week um one of my guests mentioned that in in a way it's not so much a kind of um subgenre in the same way that like a zombie movie is or a slasher movie that are very kind of formatted like a, a vampire movie is just a movie with a vampire in but that could be so varied right it can be anything from like a teen romance to like a gothic horror or whatever else oh yeah i think they're probably the closest monster to us in terms of humanity because mm, they're mm-hmm. uh, more often than not i would put the vampire as like an anti-hero rather than a villain or um a hero they're usually in that kind of liminal space in between that that danger that transgressive quality to them um i think is very mm. enticing and it's something that we as you know regular everyday humans um, have to contend with and you know how much do we lean into our desires and I think vampires kind of represent that excess yeah and I, like I was uh, you know I was wondering what what do you think the kind of the reason behind the popular like the the enduring popularity of the vampire is because it feels like some sub genres like slashers they kind of peak and then they dip and it feels like vampires 
basically since the birth of cinema, right, have sort of been very popular. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. And I I think it's in large part because of um, their supernatural beingness. Uh, They have two kind of main tenets that I always think of them with, like um, they're sexy and they have to feed. So I think that gets us really close to two taboos that we as a culture are really obsessed with, you know, sex and sexuality. And then feeding as a kind of addiction. I think there's really interesting narratives within the vampire lore that can explore these things. And as you know, you and I both know, and I'm sure all of your listeners know as well, uh, talking about sexuality and addiction is really hard to do in a real life situation because they're really sensitive uh, topics that have so many wide reaching implications. So when we can, you know, look at sexy vampires with like sexy histories and have fun with it, and it's very over the top, it can um, be a healthy way to explore those things so true yeah it's such a good point and and do you think that you've seen do you think that there's a clear sort of change in vampires one of the things that a lot of my guests have talked about so far is that vampires have maybe <clears throat> not just maybe, maybe not gone soft but have maybe drifted out of the horror genre over the last 20 or 30 years since stuff like twilight or even interview with the vampire or whatever you know like it's kind of gone from maybe just trying to frighten us to doing other things i suppose yeah i i think what's kind of happened in the right around twilight mm. um because there's a few other things that came to mind when i was thinking about that era but it's the uh what i've been calling in my mind notes the soap operatization of vampires <laughs> yes um and they're being explored more and more in like long form content you mm. know whether it's long ass books by stephanie myers into huge film franchise into true blood into multiple blade films the underworld franchise yeah. we're really kind of grappling with this and i think soap opera to me makes a lot of sense because yes soap operas are dramatic and they're big and they're people falling in and out of love and dying and killing each other but they're often in large part about family structures mm. and structures within you know communities and towns whether it's business or you know small um you know rural communities it's how these people grapple with each other for power when they're yeah. tied to each other and it, this that's a really huge narrative throughout all of you know culture and storytelling forever but i think when i think of these um films like a vampire film it's often about where they're coming from and how that structure has upheld itself and what happens when an interloper gets involved and Mm. does the um you know whatever pact that it is progress or does it kind of have to be weeded out and killed exactly yeah and vampire films are so often about families right you know whether it's the lost boys or interview with the vampire this idea of kind of choosing your own family you know being accepted into a community of people uh, and yeah l- who live on the kind of fringes of society in that way and we're going to talk about that a lot with what we do in the shadows i'm sure but that idea of kind of yeah c- creating your own family with vampirism yeah and it's and it's um i often find that it's such an earnest subgenre. Yes. They're yes. very like rarely do they nail like the tone of comedy, I think, as well as they do in what we're gonna talk about today. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there there is such a kind of like angsty teen quality. So I think when people get very upset about Twilight, I'm like, have you fucking seen Near Dark? Yeah. I love Near Dark, but those two are like on another like <laughs> planet of mooning after each other. It's such a good point. It's always been there. I mean, you could even go back to Dracula and there is a lot of that in Dracula, right? Yeah, I crossed oceans of time to find you. Well, I got other shit I'm doing. I'm sorry. (laughs) Exactly. Um, All right. We've got loads to cover today, so let's get straight into it. We're going to kick things off by talking about the original film version of What We Do in the Shadows from 2014. When you get three vampires in a flat, obviously there's going to be a lot of tension. Viago was an 18th century dandy. Look, a ghost cat. Vladislav is a bit of a pervert. This is my torture chamber. Deacon's like the young bad boy of the group. I'm supposed to pay rent, but I don't. The trouble with being a vampire is you have to be invited in. Come into the bar, please. Four dollars Will you invite us in? We need some fresh blood. Hi, my name is Nick. I've been a vampire for two months. 
So, what we do in the shadows from 2014. Alex, set the scene for us. Give us a little plot synopsis. You got it. So, the film follows four vampire roommates who must deal with the night-to-night realities of living with each other. Viago is a vampire from the Victorian era, and he is a hopeless romantic still trying to connect with his lost love while she is in her senior years. Vladislav the Poker is known for his brutality, but must come to grips with his mortal enemy and ex, the Beast. Deacon is the youngest vampire who is trying to maintain his bad boy status after a young man, Nick, is turned into a vampire by their fourth roommate, Peter. Uh, Peter is a monstrous basement dwelling vampire entity who is older than the rest of them. Throughout the film, the roommates run afoul of werewolves and other supernatural entities, as well as make many friends along the way. Amazing. You know, I'm always in awe of you and Andrea on the Faculty of Horror and how good your plot synopses are, because you always just nail that in you. I honestly, like, it's always, we, we have a little, like tete a tete about who's doing what beforehand. <laughs> yeah. And then when you were like, okay, plot synopsize the plot, I was like, God damn it, that's the God greatest podca- podcasting trick of all time. I know. Have the always. guests on and make them do it. Absolutely. Always make the guests do it. Yeah. So, um, so what do you think of this movie? Oh my God. Perfect movie. 10 out of 10. No notes. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah. It is. What, what was your sort of history with it? Did you see it when you when it first came out? Yes, I saw it really early on. It premiered at TIFF here in Toronto and I got to see it there and I was like, oh my God, this is the best. And then I spent so many years, at least, you know, three or four years telling everyone I could to go see it yeah. because it had that kind of cult underground thing for a while. Mm-hmm. And then I think everyone who saw it was like, Oh, this is amazing. God, it's so good, isn't it? I love it so much. I actually hadn't revisited it since it first came out in 2014. So just oh, watching a it treat. a second time. Yeah, it was such a treat. Uh, it's really, it's so smart in everything it's doing, right? And I guess the first thing I want to ask you is the way in which it balances that kind of comedy with horror. Because I always find that's such a hard thing to get right, isn't it? Like, I, I you know, I, I've often found that I could probably count on one hand sort of the amount of movies that really successfully balance comedy with horror in kind of equal measure. But how do you think this film kind of handles that tonal balance? Yeah, so we uh, on Faculty of Horror talked about what we do in the shadows a few years ago Mm. now. And we did it um, uh, on an episode of Comedy and Horror. So we did What We Do in the Shadows and Young Frankenstein. Amazing. And uh, we were pulling some, you know, different uh, writing and ideas on on comedy and horror, um, as we were wont to do. And basically there was a lot of really great writing about how you can either have comedy horror where the emphasis is comedy, Mm -hmm. or you can have horror comedy where the emphasis is horror. Right. Now I think what we do in the shadows works so well, actually similar to young Frankenstein is because it is in its lane in, in a comedy, but it's a fan of the horror that it's playing with it understands the references it's it's happy to wrestle with them it's like there's such a deep entrenched knowledge that once you kind of get into those first few laughs i always feel very relaxed because i'm like okay these filmmakers know what they're doing i don't have to be like up in my horror fan head about this they got this yes i completely agree And, and and you're right and this one is more comedy horror i suppose right i think predominantly it's it's there to make us laugh right more than it is to sort of scare us or whatever but uh but it does feel like it loves the genre it really does and actually it was funny i was watching it with my wife and she actually jumped at a moment which is when they wake up peter and he then just kind of like snarls at with his creepy eyes and it's like yeah i mean like it does still have those elements of brilliant gothic horror to it as well right in the middle of this hilarious comedy movie absolutely yeah. and i and i think it's also just um and in, in thinking about it because this i mean i want to say 2014 is maybe as we're kind of in the hangover era of twilight yeah um you know i think for a lot of us not only the fans but everyone who is kind of on the outside of it um so i think actually what we do in the shadows is such a good film to have come out at this period because it's never making fun of twilight it's never punching down that's not what this mm. comedy style is about like uh, Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clements. That's not really what they do. Mm. Thank God. Um, but I think it's a great film to have come out because it actually just wants to wrestle with vampire cultural history yeah. in so many ways and like 
have fun with it. And, you know, we're, we need the brooding, serious vampires, but we also have to be able to have a bit of a wink and a laugh with it as well. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think you're right. You know, this was only, what, two years after Breaking Dawn Part 2. So I think we were still in that, the shadow of the Twilight franchise. And it did feel like maybe <clears throat> it might have been quite difficult to, to, to take vampires completely seriously at this point in time. In fact, I feel like we're only just getting back to that with maybe things like Midnight Mass and next year we're getting a new Salem's Lot and it feels like we're now in a place finally where sort of vampires maybe can become quite scary and threatening again but I think there was a while there where filmmakers had to do something a bit different I think with the vampire and something a bit fun and knowing with it a lot of the time you know yeah I think it was because it was so like because Twilight and True Blood and and, um, even Underworld like Mm. they're so earnest yeah. There is no like winking to camera. There's no sense of humor within those films. I mean, True Blood a bit, but um, there is such an earnest quality to them that this mm-hmm. is like, okay, we need to let the air out of the tires a little bit and yeah. like know that we can laugh at this and play with it. And what do you think this movie is doing in that regard? Like, would you call this, you know, like, is this a spoof? Is it a kind of parody? Is it an homage? Like, how would you kind of describe it and its relationship to the vampire subgenre? I think you could qualify it as any of those. I think it's like a really fair argument. I tend to land more in the parody because Mm. if we think about parody as imitation of a style, uh, what we do in the shadows, I think, is an imitation of multiple styles because uh, we've got, you know, the interview with the vampire dandy. We've Mm. got the Bram Stoker's Dracula with Vlad the Poker. Uh, We've got, you know, the... Deacon Frost Blade Vampire with Deacon, yes. uh, Nosferatu with Pieter. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we've got all of these things. And then this like young guy, Nick coming in and just being like, oh, I'm a vampire. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's, you know, that kind of like, oh, well, now everyone's talking about vampires and we hate that mm-hmm. as a secret society. It's so like perfect without being too on the nose. So I, tend to go with parody, but I think you can make the argument for any of them. I also think this film is really successful in the visual language it creates. Mm. Um, The tonality, I think the music is brilliant. Uh, It kind of has that like old world quality, um, which I find so evocative. And one of my just favorite sequences from a filmmaking standpoint in terms of like the work that it does while being so entertaining is when uh, the vampires, it's early on in the film and they go out on the town. And (laughs) I mean, like getting dressed montage A++, but (laughs) when they're actually out, you actually learn so much about this world because you're meeting the other vampires, the other supernatural entities. We see them trying to get into clubs. So we understand that this is a real world that we all acknowledge, Mm -hmm. but that we're only seeing part of it. And it's done quickly. It's done, you know, it's just so effective and smart. There are between 60 and 70 vampires in the greater Wellington region. Obvious vampire. Yoli. Hello. Yoli. <laughs> He's um, a guy I used to work with when I was human. No, he's gone. gone. Yeah, he's gone. I've been draining him all night. <laughs> but a very thirsty girl. <laughs> I completely agree. Like, that's what's the genius about it is that it is, these are obviously larger than life characters, but there's something so human about all of them, right? And and these inter- these awkward interactions and the dynamics and the comedy and the power play and it's, you know, roommates living together and all of this stuff is all very human and very funny, but with that extra twist of them also being hundreds of years old and, you know, murderous. Because they have very <laughs> real limitations. Yes, yes. Very real basic limitations, which are so, um, you know, they're such great for comedy fodder because I think, you know, having really high status characters like vampires are, especially these ones, um, having to grapple with things that are just out of reach Mm -hmm. is a great, like, that's just, that's always going to be comedy. Yeah, it's so true. That's right. Uh, What do you think of Taika Waititi generally as a, as a, you know, and obviously this is Jermaine Clements as well. Like, what do you think of these guys and, you know, other stuff they've done elsewhere in their career? I mean, I, I'm, I'm really a big fan of their stuff. I remember watching uh, Flight of the Concords a lot uh, oh, I loved in Flight university. Of the yeah. So good, so silly, so irreverent. 
Um, and then I also really love the film uh, Hunt for the Wilder People, oh, yeah. I think is a really beautiful film that Taika Waititi did. Um, you know, and I, I really think Thor Ragnarok is one of the best Marvel films. Yeah. For my money. Yeah, he's he's great. at like I think what I love about all of his stuff, obviously, it's really, really funny and it's quite irreverent, but it also has quite a lot of heart, I think. Right. You know, yes. like. Uh, Hunt for the Wilder People is so sweet, you know, and, and, and I suppose Jojo Rabbit has a bit of that as well. And and this has that too, right? It's got this real kind of, yeah, it's got this real emotional heart to it at the center of all of this wackiness, I suppose. And I think he's also, I think they both are. I think both Jermaine Clements and Taika Waititi are both, because uh, they're actors themselves. Yeah. I think they're really big fans of actors and yeah. they really... Uh, like I, I truly have never seen Scarlett Johansson better than in Jojo Rabbit. Mm. I'm not a big fan of that movie. I think it's like I get it and I think it's fine, but I just was blown away by her in the film. Yeah. Um. And, and there's like a sense of again, like I'm going to use this word play a lot today, but there is like this looseness to her, but this like really kind of core groundedness that I was like. It just, she had this energy I hadn't seen in so long. And I was like, I love this yeah. for her. Um, and I don't know, have you seen uh, Taika Waititi's uh, newest ad that he directed with Daniel Craig for Belvedere B- Vodka? I haven't seen it. I think I've heard people talk about it, but I haven't yet checked it out. It's a very like um, Daniel Craig doing uh, the Weapon of Choice music video uh, that Christopher yeah. Walken did. Yeah. He's just like, he's literally just like boogieing through a hallway and on like <laughs> rooftops. It's, it, he really goes for it. And I think that's because Taika Waititi is so playful yes. that you can't help but just be like, I'm going to like, you know, he does like, butt bumps. He does like, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And you're so right about, you know, actors clearly respond well to working with him and seem to have the time of their life working with him as well. Daniel Craig, like, seems to... I, I feel like Daniel Craig is better than he's ever been recently since he since he dropped Bond and he's started doing, like, Knives Out and some of this other stuff. He's he's so much more fun now. I think this is great. I know. I mean, I tangent, but I remember, like, first yeah. seeing Lair Cake and being like, yeah. who is that guy? He yeah. is incredible. And it was like, he just went down the physical action route Mm. more than the like because he had amazing timing and like comic beats in that film and it's like he he was on two he was on one path and then they diverged and uh, i think he's now going going looping back and finding that other comedic path which i'm very happy about do you think that taika he you know since he's made it big big and he's now doing hollywood and marvel and that kind of thing has he still retained that same core of what he does you know like he it hasn't it hasn't disappeared in like the marvel machine or whatever Uh (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I thought Thor Love and Thunder was pretty atrocious. Yeah, I didn't see it, but I heard not not great things. Yeah. No, especially coming off of like the energy and fun and tone of Ragnarok, which I thought was so mm. strong. And mm. Love and Thunder just feels so sloppy and messy. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he was also attached to a Star Wars film at one point. Now I've heard that's under discussion based on love and thunderness of it mm. all um so i don't know I, I imagine it's really hard when you get pulled out of these like indie gigs like true indie gigs and put into the marvel universe or another big cinematic universe and yeah. you have a hit and then it's like oh you can do anything you want but can you and um i remember yeah. uh i saw an interview with taika watiti when he was promoting thor love and thunder and he was on the Stephen Colbert show and uh, Stephen Colbert was you know, talking about what we do in the shadows. He was like, I love it. I love the TV show. Can you talk about doing that? And Taika was so funny. He was talking about like, oh, we'd have to like run to Peter Jackson's soundstage and nick stuff at night because we had no money. And Amazing. then we just had to be sure to return it in the morning. And he's <laughs> finding out about this now, I guess. It was so like funny and endearing. And I think now when you just have no seemingly almost no limitations, um, yeah. that can often be a bad thing because I think, you know, art can be good with limitations, as we talked about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think he's, he's he, he clearly did such a great job in Ragnarok. Like, it, it did feel like it had a lot of that YTT heart and comedy and everything else, but it's a shame that it, it maybe has gotten lost. And I would love to see him come back and do some weird little indie New Zealand comedy again, actually, at some point. That would be great, you know? Um, and speaking of, actually, you know, you mentioned Peter Jackson as well. Like, we, we've talked a little bit on this podcast before about 
New Zealand horror and like that that it does seem to have this kind of really fun you know very massive generalization but but when you think of New Zealand horror and some of the big ones like Brain Dead or you know Bad Taste those kind of Peter Jackson movies or whatever else Housebound um, they do have this really fun kind of playful element that mixes in with the horror right but but do you think this feels specifically kind of New Zealand in that way or or is this a story that could essentially be set anywhere do you think I I think this is a very specifically New Zealand film um, mm. I think they're setting it within you know the New Zealand um, documentary world uh, the use yeah. of weapons Wellington, I thought was great. And I think it's, it's like a deeply dry humor with mm. really high stakes circumstances. And it's yeah. always that kind of muted reaction to everything that's surrounding you. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that feels so, um, true to where that uh, where a lot of comedy from that country comes from. And, I, and it might also be informed by the fact I was working um, at that time around when What We Do in the Shadows came out with um, a, a woman who was from New Zealand and kind of knew these guys a little bit in the comedy oh, world. Cool. And I think she was she was always talking about like, oh, you know, New Zealanders, we don't care about anything. You know, throw it in. Excellent accent. Oh, Excellent you. accent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was very like, it, it's it's so kind of like everything just rolls off their back and it's just kind of yeah. like, you know, okay, well, we'll just, yeah, all right. All right. We've seen this before. So I always yeah. thought that was um, really true to them. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, you know, I was talking about this, I think it was when we talked about Peter Jackson in my last series and I had um, Lucy O'Brien on, who is a journalist and she's from New Zealand. And we were talking about the difference in kind of New Zealand horror and Australian horror. And there is such a difference in sensibilities. And, you know, obviously that comes down to culture and history and everything else. There is a kind of harshness in, in Australian yes. horror. That, and, and there is, going back to what we were saying about Taika Waititi, there is almost a kind of warmth about New Zealand horror in a weird way in, in, in the characters and in the kind of situations that we often find ourselves in, despite it also being bloodthirsty and gory and horrific as well, you know? And, and I think especially because, like, you know, New Zealand's own history of colonialism and, um, you know, both uh, Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement, you know, coming from indigenous cultures uh, t- of New Zealand, that yeah. they um, there is this kind of, like, uh, exhaustion with white nonsense. Yes. Which yes. I think is kind of perfect for, like, the vampire elite. Yes. It's this, you know, like, no, there's actually a lot of, you know, fluff that goes into it that actually doesn't really matter and we can make fun of it and it's quite self-effacing as well like i think taika waititi and jermaine clements are so good at like you said they don't punch down but they sort of punch down at themselves i suppose like i think and that is really funny as well you know it works really well yeah um and you you mentioned there is this obviously like there's the sort of mockumentary style to this and we'll talk about this a lot with the tv show i expect as well but how effective do you find that the kind of like you know as opposed to shooting this as a normal narrative feature you know using that documentary style for this particular film i I think it's such a rich ground to explore for comedy and obviously we've got you know the history with you know rob reiner's spinal tap and then christopher gast and his subsequent films Mm. uh you know so there's always been this through line of a mockumentary and i think there's a few reasons for that i think when you do a mockumentary um even similar to like found footage in horror, like with yeah. Blair Witch Project or something like that. If you're entering a world that is kind of, you know, seen as niche or unfamiliar, you need um, uh, you need a reason to explain it to the audience. Mm-hmm. You need a reason to kind of invite them into this world and get them up to speed pretty quickly. And even if it's like, I think Spinal Tap is such an interesting example because it's using that like hard rock persona, but like, what does a manager do? Why would the manager be involved with this? Why would he need a cricket bat? You yes. know, it's, it's these little <laughs> asides to camera that actually give us a much more in-depth worldview. And I think another great thing about mockumentaries in terms of like um, comedy especially is that there are like layers of reality to it. Mm-hmm. So there's something that, you know, a character is saying to camera and then the actual action itself. <laughs> yes, It's how someone presents yes. themselves versus you know, the third, you know, omniscient narrator angle um, that can be. So again, it's so rich for comedy, Mm -hmm. uh, that disconnect, that, that 
cognitive disconnect that we all have is like it's such a great beat and payoff for comedy i completely agree it works so well and like you're right you know that i think the i think when they go wrong sometimes is when they're using it because it's it's funny but they haven't really thought about it much you know and i think the best ones including this you kind of know in world what that crew are doing. They acknowledge that there are camera people there and they acknowledge that they're being followed for a documentary or whatever it is, right? And I guess this is the same with found footage. It's the bad found footage movies are the ones where you go, well, why is that person filming that? And what, you know, who's edited this or whatever? Whereas it feels like, and especially with the TV show, I love it in the TV show, but the way that every now and then the crew sort of become part of what's happening you know i think they do that in a really smart way in this yeah it's um yeah it, it was interesting i was listening to another podcast uh, earlier this week and they were talking about the new movie uh she said which is about the harvey weinstein investigation yes. of the two journalists from the new york times based on their book um and they were talking they it wound up being a much bigger conversation about journalism and horror uh, mm. sorry journalism in film and how journalists are kind of used as uh, conduits for the audience. Yeah. yeah. They're investigators. They're looking, they're trying to tell you the story. So you have to kind of follow along with them. And I think mockumentaries and watching, you know, all the, what we do in the shadows this week was like, Oh, we've just removed that character. And now we get to have that direct connection to the characters. Mm. So, you know, especially when, you know, they're ca- like the casting in both this and the TV series in my mind is pretty perfect. Yeah. Um, and like, it's like, Oh no, they're just talking to me. This yes. is great. And there's a warmth there and there's like, a, yeah, it's it's just, it was so, you you need the right cast to pull this off. You do actually. And I think it, again, like it, it's a really interesting parallel to found footage because again, that with found footage, like the, the point of it is you have to sort of quote unquote believe it, right? Like obviously not actually believe it, but you do have to suspend your disbelief to the point where you believe that what is happening in the world of this film is real and is being filmed. And that comes down to the performances as well. It's, you know, that's why Heather was so amazing in the Blair Witch Project or whatever, like the best ones have that element of realism. And yeah, you're right. Like all of these actors, again, like considering they're quite big, larger than life characters, there are those little like, minute moments of humanity and it's the little glances towards the camera or whatever it might be that the 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 performances really sell it i think don't they yeah oh completely do you have any faves in this cast of characters i mean probably jermaine clement (laughs) yes so good i like i I've seen this film a number of times and just the scene when he's at the computer and he talks about doing his dark bidding and it's an online auction. (laughs) That shouldn't be funny to me, but it is every damn time I laugh my ass off because he's so it's so important to him. Yes. Um, uh, What about you? I uh, yeah, I think it would probably be. uh, But actually, Deacon as well. is yeah. really funny as well and the kind of uh, the the sort of relationship between him and Nick and the way that sort of changes throughout the film is is really fun and really great and really sweet but they're all amazing like you say I think and we'll talk about this with the TV show I'm sure but it is just sort of perfect casting all round I think isn't it and obviously mm-hmm. Taika Waititi and his character and his relationship with his you know his his love who has obviously grown older and then there's that joke at the end about the age difference it's just perfect like I love it all it's so so good yeah no it's it's just it's so like there's again that warmth to it Mm -hmm. where it's like you feel like okay I'm kind I'm safe in this world with these people even though they're monsters yeah um yeah I mean I guess that's kind of it for the I mean is there anything else you want to mention on the film before we move on to the tv show any favorite moments any highlights that you want to flag there was one that jumped out at me in this rewatch and it Mm. was like uh it's because this is what I imagine the royal family is waiting to do to Harry when they can get their hands on him which is (laughs) the shame circle (laughs) yes (laughs) I just imagine like Charles and Will and Kate and Camilla just you know shame shame perfect for your crimes you will be made to suffer the procession of shame and now. Shame. 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 Bad vampire. Shame. And they're all kind of like out of sync doing it. And it's like they're, it's, they're trying to get in sync. And it's just like, yes. And yes. You, you yeah. Perfect. Because like. you. That's, that's the bureaucracy and the awkwardness of bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so... 
silly and it's mm-hmm. delightful to be silly because I think we all face bureaucracy in our everyday lives, yes. whether you're, you know, uh, getting your driver's license renewed or uh, you're in part of a corporate office. It's, mm. you know, it's all part of our lives. And so to get to just like take the wind out of it, I think is perfect. It's so good. And I also love uh, the werewolves as well. And like the, the the moment when they come across the gang of werewolves and obviously you've got Reese Darby from Flight of the Concords. So good. And again, like this, this sweetness to them that they don't like swearing and all of this kind of thing, right? It's so good. <laughs> Hey, 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 don't uh, swear. Sorry, they, they, yeah. we're werewolves. Not swearing. What are we? Werewolves, not swearing. Oh, no, it's, it's a very offensive word to call people. Well, unless you're it? talking about a bundle of sticks. Chase, this bundle of sticks. Werewolves. No, don't no, no, get no, it. No, and then, oh, and also when I think it's Viago throws the a fake throws a ball and one of them goes to run after it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's, you don't, no one, like, I feel like with, like, when big studio films would never keep that in and never put that in. And it's like, no, these are all the little, like, touches of uh, really talented actors and great filmmakers working together to create what feels like a really full real world and the 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 police as well really made me laugh and when the police visit and they have to hypnotize them and like all of that is amazing and again like even those smaller supporting performances of like those two police officers are so funny and so real i think as well you know it's just perfect yeah. gotta check your fire alarms <laughs> gotta check your fire. Exactly. something to think about <laughs> something to think about it's, it's a good point Let's see what i'm saying what's that man you're joking not a smoke alarm in sight. No smoke detectors, mate. Rule number one, smoke detectors. Okay. Rule number two, maybe not so many barbecues inside. Sort of okay. that, fellas. Um, so before we get in to the rest of this week's episode in which Alex and I discuss what we do in The Shadows, the TV show, I just want to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Jamie B. Jamie wrote me a lovely little message which I'm going to read out now. Jamie says, Hi Mike, it's a real honour to be able to support and sponsor my favourite podcast. I discovered EOH earlier this year and I'm proud or maybe a little embarrassed to admit that I've binge listened to the entire podcast within the space of a few months and I am now fully caught up that's over 10,000 minutes worth of listening oh my god I've always wanted to find a podcast that is both smart and informative but also fun and accessible and EOH ticks all my boxes I'm also obsessed with many of your guests some of my favorites include Mary Wilde Louise Blaine and Brad Hansen but I've got to give a special shout out to the Dream Warriors team, Stevie Webb and Becky Dark. Whenever you three discuss movies, it brightens my week. And I've listened to some of your Patreon episodes, particularly the Valentine Slasher episode, multiple times. Thanks again for being such great company in a very dark and stressful year. As we're approaching the end of an amazing year for horror, I thought I would finish by listing my top 10 horror movies of the year. Love this. So I'm going to read Jamie B's list now. So here's top 10 of the year. At number 10, Halloween Ends. Number 9, Hellraiser. Number 8, Pearl. Number 7, Bones and All. 6, Speak No Evil. 5, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. 4, Crimes of the Future. 3, Orphan First Kill. 2, Scream. And number 1, X. That's an astonishing list. Thank you so much for sharing your list and thank you so much for that really lovely message, Jamie B. Um, it, I'm so grateful that you have been not only binge listening to the podcast, but also you signed up to Patreon and you are supporting the making of this podcast. And also, that's an excellent top 10. What a strong year it's been for horror, right? Like I've been talking about this with friends and colleagues recently. It's going to be really difficult to narrow this down to just 10 because this has been I think one of the strongest years we've had in a very long time even just looking at some of those bangers on your list Jamie X Scream Crimes of the Future Bodies 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 Speak No Evil Bones and All absolutely incredible and of course Orphan First Kill what a banger one more time a huge thank you to this week's sponsor that's $20 Patreon subscriber Jamie B and if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor get your own little dedicated segment on a podcast episode just like this then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at a $20 level patreon.com slash Evolution 
of horror. Okay, let's move in to the second half of this week's episode because it's time to discuss one of the greatest TV comedy shows I have seen in a very long time. This is the TV adaptation of What We Do in the Shadows. Nadja, Laszlo! Yeah. Yes? Can you come downstairs for a second, please? The problems with living with other vampires are the vampires I have chosen to stay with. I wanted to talk about general hygiene in the cell. How not? Last night, there were all these people down there, half drunk. Well, where did they find the alcohol? No, they were half drunk. They've been half drunk. If you've got something to say, then damn well say it. It's not hygienic! <laughs> Right, Alex, let's talk about this incredible TV show, What We Do in the Shadows, because there's so much to say. So obviously, after the kind of cult success, as we've mentioned, of the New Zealand film, What We Do in the Shadows from 2014, it then went into development as a TV show. In January 2018, it was announced that FX had given the production a pilot order. The pilot was written by Jermaine Clement and directed by Taika Waititi. Uh, And then on May the 3rd, 2018, it was announced that FX had given the production a first season of 10 episodes, which premiered in 2019. And since then, it has been renewed and renewed and renewed. There are four seasons out and a fifth season is currently being filmed. Um, So I guess in many ways, this is an extension of the film. We're not dealing with the same characters. We've moved the action from New Zealand, from Wellington, over to Staten Island in New York. So this is now set in America, but it is with a very kind of uh, multinational cast. So we've got Matt Berry playing Laszlo Cravensworth. He lives with Nandor, played by Kaven Novak, uh, his wife Nadja, played by Natasha Dimitru, uh, and uh, also Nandor's familiar Guillermo, played by Har. Gillen. Uh, and then there is also an energy vampire that lives with them called Colin Robinson. And essentially, like the film, this is a documentary crew following life in this house of vampires and familiars, right? And uh, and we will get into particular plot arcs and character arcs as we go. But first of all, Alex, let me just ask you, what did you think when this when this show first launched? Did you sort of jump straight into it from the beginning? No, I, I'm always a bit suspicious of spinoffs. I'm not always a big right. like horror TV show fan. Um, and I know that they had done um, a few seasons of Wellington Paranormal uh, based on the police officer characters. And I didn't really get into that. I started it and I just didn't stay with it so i was a bit like oh and then i knew it was it shoots in toronto the tv show shoots in toronto uh so i kind of knew a couple people peripherally who were working on it Uh, but it was only really during the pandemic Mm. that i started Mm. it and then you know the pandemic and pandemic brain is real so i kind of enjoyed it a few seasons and then i got you know sucked into something else um and it was really in the last four months with the new season, it was season four coming oh. back and my friend uh, Joanne texting me and saying, are you watching the new season? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not, but I, I want to. And she was like, okay, because Nadja's opening the Blade Blood Rave <laughs> Club. <laughs> yeah. And she literally listened to me all summer go on about how Blade Blood Rave is the best sequence in all of film. I love that. Well, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so I had a kind of similar vibe to you. Initially, I was reluctant to watch it because for me, a lot of horror television shows and horror spin-offs on television haven't worked that well. I did watch the first season when it first came out in 2018 or 2019 rather. Um, and I liked it. I really liked it. But for whatever reason, I think just because there is so much TV to keep up with, so I kind of dropped off. And I never watched it beyond that first season um and so over the last few weeks i have been binging every single episode of what we do in the shadows i've watched everything from season one episode one through to season four episode 10 i've been messaging you alex throughout as i've been watching it and let me tell you i have fallen in love with this show this might be my favorite thing i've watched all year it's my favorite thing i've watched as part of this vampire series by far it is genius it's laugh out loud funny it's so well written it's so well performed it's so interesting it's so creative i love the drama i love the characters i love 
everything about this show. I think it's superior to the film in almost every way. And I was actually really sad that I had fully caught up and got to the end of it because now I have to wait however long for season five. It is so, like, both heartwarming and incredibly creative. Oh, it, the twists yeah. and turns and the risks that it takes yeah. where I'm like, that's not going to work. That's not going to work at all. And then you're like, dear God, it works. Yes. It pulled. Yes. You're so right. Like, the, and cause I did, I remember thinking through season one, as much as I was enjoying it, I was like, how, how, like, how do they stretch this across, you know, multiple seasons, this kind of concept, but they take such clever risks with like what they do with characters and where they take storylines to the point where, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of our chat how there's a kind of soap opera element. I am fully invested in these characters <laughs> like I am in a soap opera or, you know, drama or whatever, you know? Yeah. And I've like, I, you know, when I was like watching season four and by that point I was like, oh, so Nadia. Yeah. So Nadia. <laughs> like, yes, I know. So yeah, how do you find it generally in comparison to the film? I think it is such a smart build on the film because it still feels like they're playing within the exact same world, but on the other side of the world. Yes. So if that one, if the film took place in New Zealand, this one is firmly on Staten Island, aka Toronto. I, yeah, I love um, that. I didn't know it was Toronto. That's awesome. How cool. Yes, mm. yeah. And I've only heard uh, lovely things um, from the, about the set and the crew and the creative. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, the only bad thing I've heard is that it's a lot of night shoots. So yes. it's brutal for that. But that everyone is, especially the leads, are so lovely and amazing. Yeah. So I'm always like, good, because I love it so much. Yes. Um, but yeah, apparently they are all like rock stars. And oh. I think with the film, especially when you're, oh God, I love a brief under 90 minute runtime. Oh, so good. So but when good. you're dealing with that, what you look at with the problems the vampires are dealing with that I outlined in the synopsis are really like big general ones, mm. like issues with an ex, worrying about your place within a group, lost love, real big in general. And I think the, f- the TV show does a lot of legwork in the first season to set up how they're just going to detail into like the minutia mm, of humanity mm-hmm. and the shit that we all take is like you know this is life this is how we have to operate within this world and they just start poking little holes in it <laughs> yes yes and they just start like picking it apart and being really messy with it and i'm like yes this is this feels good and they and they the way the characters are, they're so free to be within the world, which I think is really smart. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not against humans. They're not, you know, they're not anything. They're just kind of figuring it out. Yeah. And so it, we are allowed to get into the weird stuff that our lives consist oh, of. I completely agree. And like you said, it's always, there's always that cynical part of my brain that goes, mm, when you've turned a film into a TV show, you know, whose idea was that and what was it done for, right? But it really does feel like they had this world that they hadn't dipped into as much as they could have, right? And and just getting to explore this world across so far four seasons has just been amazing. And yeah, like there's not really a bad episode. I mean, there are some better episodes than others and we'll talk about some of our faves, but like there's not really a dud so far in this four seasons as well. No, and when we were initially talking, you were like, oh, okay, well, I've got to really binge and get into this. Mm. And I was like oh my god that's gonna be no problem no. <laughs> super jealous you get to watch it all for the first time yeah and then you were like oh what are your faves what are you and i was like it's like picking a favorite cat <sighs> can't do it uh, can't do it it's and uh, the characters are like i love them more than my own family they're so <laughs> amazing like all of them and i have constantly shifted between like who is my favorite who i love more you know because they're all I just think the like Matt Berry is just so everything he does I think is so incredible and I think he's maybe been my consistent favourite but I love all of them you know the notorious orgy of 1937 no 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 no. don't even say the year it was a lot of just very terrible chit chat I cannot even speak the name of the vampire that organised that monstrosity I don't give a fuck his name was Mike fucking Mike it's and it's funny like and going back and rewatching um some of the episodes this week i was like what's what are all the actors doing together what what's happening here and then i was like they're like intentionally in different tv shows yes, yes. but 
they're not in our overall TV show. And like, we're seeing the overall picture and they're all, all in their own lanes mm. and they just kind of cross paths throughout the episode. And it's like, again, it, it's, it's just, it's very subtle, I think, but it's very smart. One time they tried going try on you. Which is bloody pointless because it takes me at least six months to recover from any orgy. Yes, it does. Vampire sex is like pizza in that even when it's bad, it's good. It's designed to be enjoyed by eight or more people. There's a choice of toppings. And in the morning, you're like, ah, why do I have puncture wounds on my penis? Yeah, I love that. Um, they're all, you know, heroes in their own story. And I think that's why it feels like such an ensemble. Yes. Um, and that's also why when they go off and they do these, uh, like, I think one of the most famous episodes is, you know, uh, probably on the run where, um, Laszlo goes undercover as, you know, human bartender, Jackie Daytona. Yes. <laughs> um, it's such an iconic episode, but it's like, yeah, he can carry that one episode. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm always happy when it cuts back and we see what's going on at the manor, but it's like, no, we've invested enough personally into each and every one of them. Or like when Nandor goes to the wellness center, like mm -hmm. it's, this makes sense. I've invested enough time with them. So it doesn't feel like an outlier. Yes. It's just like, I just get to spend a bit more time with my friend. You're right. Yeah. And I think that that's what's so brilliant about it is that, you know, while season one very much kind of feels a bit like the film where it's about this group of vampires living together under one roof, it's since kind of gone off and each character, not just the vampires, but also the familiars and various supporting characters, they have their own brilliant arcs and plot threads that we kind of jump between. And Every single one of these characters I love. And I think this is what the genius of this show is. Compared to the film, it's got room to flesh out these characters and add in some really interesting different types of characters, the likes of which we didn't see in the film. And maybe we should start off by talking about the characters. And I want to start by talking about the big new addition to the cast, the new type of vampire that we get in the TV show, which is an energy vampire called Colin Robinson. My name is Colin Robinson, and I am what's known as a psychic vampire or energy vampire. This is my office, also known as the hunting ground. Hi, Deb. Energy vampires drain people's energy merely by talking Jeez, to them. Actual versus budget year to date? No thanks. You're going to be at that all day. We either bore you with a long conversation. I'm feeling better now. I was a little sick this weekend. Hey, Don. Or we enrage you. In fact, you probably know an energy vampire. We're the most common kind of vampire. Alex, tell us about Colin Robinson. Who is Colin Robinson? I mean, Colin Robinson presents as a very ordinary <laughs> cis white man and yeah. uh, works in an office. He doesn't seem to drink blood or anything like that. Uh, he can go out in the daylight and... He he will just take the energy from anyone and he will get it by talking absolute nonsense, boring stats to them. And I think we have all met a Colin Robinson, if not many. Yes. Oh God, it's so good. Like it's so relatable. Uh, and yeah, this, this, uh, and, and it's really to begin with, and I suppose even still at this point, at the end of season four, we don't quite know what Colin's deal is, like what he is. In the first season, I was like, is he actually just a guy? Like, is he just a human dude? Because at that point, we don't really know if he has any particular powers. He walks around during the day. He's not like a traditional vampire like the others. Um, he's just a guy that goes around getting off on boring people, essentially, right? But then, of course, as it goes on, there's this, there's that amazing episode in season two when he's promoted and he starts like levitating <laughs> and all these other things, and he splits himself into three. And then, of course, like everything that happens with him in the last season uh, is like, wow, he is this. It's like they're building this weird mythology of this new creature, this new monster. It's amazing, know? and it's such a like. We talk like we t we like to pontificate, yeah, uh, like about horror and what horror means and what is the new. Con we always get asked at faculty. I'm sure you get asked the same. Like, where is horror going and what does it mean? Yes. And I'm like, 
I think it's Colin Robinson. I think that is <laughs> the energy sucking vampire, uh, whether it's fucking Donald Trump or the idiot in your office. They just like yeah. thrive on taking our energy and like using it for themselves. So good. His little face when he does like feed on people and he, he does that. Yeah, he does that amazing smile. So good. And obviously as well, it's it's really there's the addition of a woman in the main yes. g- group of vampires as well. Right. Like Nadia feels like she, her character really kind of adds something to this group dynamic as well I think you know yeah because she's like a really fully rounded character who's really in touch with her femininity and she's not above like you know calling shit out all of the time um (laughs) and I think especially as you get into her being a club owner uh you see in that kind of like entrepreneurial ship within her like each each and every one of them kind of has their own trajectory as we were talking Mm -hmm. about earlier but I think hers is like oh, we can actually just have, uh, you know, very thoughtful and progressive comedy that is very absurd and very over the top. Um, yeah. But her just like calling out like, every time she gets angry at the cursed hat. Oh, my God. It's so good. <laughs> she's so angry. And I'm like, yeah, wait, wait. yeah, I felt that. Nozzle's stupid hat. It's got a bloody huge curse on it. I have tried to throw it out many times, but it keeps crawling back. Literally. I acquired this hat while draining the blood of a Bavarian Hexenbrenner, or witch burner. He must have noticed me eyeing it, as in his dying breath, he said, take my hat, it's cool. Yes, it is cool, I thought. It's so good. And it goes back to the idea as well of, you know, these characters are actually so human. And Narja's relationship, her marriage with Laszlo is hilarious and it is genuinely quite sweet. These two are sort of, they, you know, real marriage goals, I would say, right? They're so, like, they know each other so well. They have the really weird chemistry and you're like, yeah, yeah, I buy it. Yeah. I buy it. I buy it. And and again, Laszlo, I've already mentioned it, but Matt Berry, for me, I think maybe is the person that consistently makes me laugh the most in every single episode his character is brilliant i love his horny couldn't give a fuck attitude but also it is something to do with the way matt berry delight uh, delivers every single line he's got this irritating habit of giving you orders just at the moment of climax so you're both there in the moment and then he barks an order and you're heard what i beg your pardon mm. expects you to have listened during the climax. And it's just like, even like there's compilations on YouTube that you can find of him just like, quote unquote, mispronouncing things on the show. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, how do you come up with these? And they're all like little throwaway moments. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, it's, and then I, I was watching, um, because I was watching all these compilations of what we do with the shadows yeah. uh, when I needed a fix. Uh, I got served up, um, it's it's based in a, a record store in LA, the What's in Your Bag, where it's notable people will go in and pick up vinyl and then they tell you this is why I got this. And obviously Matt Berry is also a big music guy yes. and musician himself. And so watching him, he's so like super calm. It's not particularly funny. Mm. He's like, I really like this record. This is really good. You might want to think about this one. I really, this is weird, but I really enjoy it. It's so like normal <laughs> that because you just expect him to be, I always expect him to be like, um, you know, Toast of London yes. or Garth Marenghi's Dark Place or yes. uh, what we do in the shadows. That's it. It's just such a distinctive, interesting way of saying and pronouncing things. I always love it every time he calls Nadja my darling. He goes, my darling. (laughs) Whoa, whoa, lead them to it, my darling. My darling. I love Laszlo. I do. Of course. It's always my darling. I seem to have got my crotch stuck to the taxidermy fox's mouth again. Whoopsie. Um, And then finally, we need to talk about arguably the real love story of this show, which is Nandor and his relationship with his familiar Guillermo. Guillermo. Guillermo? You're still angry about that vampire tried to eat you, aren't you? Yes. Don't deny it. I can tell. I said yes. See, I knew it. Guillermo, I'm sorry for how I treated you tonight. I appreciate you. I really do. These two have the sort of sweetest you know, really interesting relationship that kind of shifts and evolves throughout the show, right? They really have the kind of soap opera element, I feel like, of this TV show. Yeah. And it's just, again, like they love each other, 
but they're also frustrated by each other. And like, what is more about love than that? Being yeah. irritated yeah. with your significant other. And I love how this film just, or sorry, I love how this TV show again, in all of these little kind of seemingly subtle ways just feels so progressive because again, not only yeah. is this about your chosen family, but how do you adapt to people? How do you like bring them along with you? Or how do you, you know, start to relate to people differently as you learn more and where do you fail and where do you make, make it better? It's, it's again, it's a very, for a show about monsters, it's deeply, deeply human. It is, and you're right. It's got that lovely progressive quality to it, and 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 I love the way that they really they lean into this idea of that the vampires are all pretty sexually fluid, you know, like, and they it's just like it's wonderful the way that all the dynamics kind of evolve and 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 twist and turn in that regard, you know. Yeah, and another thing I think that the show does thematically really well in that kind of progressive -y vein. And I think actually a lot of the vampire genre does this. You might be able to argue, but it picks it up from the film and it's the use of kind of fake historical documents or paintings or art. <laughs> yes, the art is so good. It's so good. And it's all like so beautifully done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's used constantly to illustrate things and, and reference back to things. Um, and I think it's always fascinating when you think about vampires because they can live forever. Mm. Um, they have a connection to the past that we don't have. So they're able to say, you know, I was there and it was not like that, or I was there and it was actually like this. And I think the use in the film and in the TV show of flashing up art that looks really well done and looks real and then contrasting it with their kind of real take on yeah. it is actually like, you know what? History's not actually what you thought it was. Yeah, it's uh, Question it. Exactly. I love it so much. And it's just, it's used in very, sometimes very throwaway ways. Like when we cut to these mm -hmm. historical documents or pay, like it, again, like everything feels real and natural and throwaway in the way they talk about it. But it just like, it drops you little breadcrumbs of this world that it's building throughout and it's just it's done in such a clever way and also with that you get it's not just vampires right we get introduced to obviously werewolves again but then there's an episode about witches and there's an episode about ghosts and it is bringing in all of these kind of horror archetypes and tropes really kind of seamlessly as well you know yeah and it's just they all have to kind of interact with each other and work with each other or work against each other and so every time one of like there's a new introduction of something i'm like ooh, how is this yeah. going to be handled because you don't know no season four has the introduction of the djinn right who kind of grants wishes mm. as well and it's like yeah it's really cool the way that they in introduce all these different elements um and we talked about this briefly with the film you know you talked about the mockumentary style and how that owes a debt to people like christopher guest and and spinal tap and i guess it's even more prominent in TV comedy, isn't it? And especially in the 21st century, I, I guess sort of post The Office, it feels like we've had so many shows that kind of adapt that format. Do you think that the show does a good job again, like the film did of kind of pulling off that documentary style? I mean, yeah, but it, it's, it's so intrinsic to the DNA of it. Um, that I think to do it any other way would feel really odd. Um, I think if anything, it probably was like a great linchpin for business mm. like tv executive stateside could see like oh there is a cult film it is already using this format yeah it can probably translate to um to this kind of uh format and it can probably run for a long time based on the success of like the office and parks and rec it, it yeah. you know it's a multiple season thing that they can get out of it yeah the office particularly the u.s office yeah. i suppose is like such a linchpin isn't it because i think it proved that you could take that high concept but actually expand it into this big long running narrative that you can follow like a soap opera and you can be emotionally invested in all these characters and you still maintain that comedy and that awkward comedy of that mockumentary style but introduce all these other elements and make it work across such a long period of time I think which is what this show seems to be doing so well yeah, yeah and I think that's you know it's again on the kind of business of TV and film. It's it's about what is longevity and how can you extend IP to be really cynical. But I think mm -hmm. this this does uh what we do in the shadows does it in that kind of subversive way where it's always changing, it's always getting really like sick and gross and mm -hmm. you know, kind of has a bit of a middle finger to that. But um I think it definitely helped convince some execs to green light it. So I'm all for it. So good. And what do you think of the transference from New Zealand to quote unquote Staten Island right and because I think what's really interesting as well is that we've given it a new setting 
And also what's kind of interesting is that so many of the cast are British as well. So you've got this kind of New Zealand show transferred to America, filmed in Toronto, starring a load of Brits. Um, But how do you think all those kind of elements work in this? I I think, um, you know, because a lot of, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, you know, we're kind of dealing with this like Commonwealth colonial history, you know, in Toronto or in Canada, we still have like the fucking queen on our money. Yeah. We're still waiting yeah. for our Prince Charles money. God, um, yeah. uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, we have this kind of like, a lot of us aren't that indebted to your country. Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, yeah not taken. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a white settler in a country that was, you know, murdered indigenous people to claim land. So, you know, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah. I think America's is very much its own beast because um, it, you know, fought the war of independence. It, you know, really hated you guys for a while. It really did. Um, yeah. And yeah, so now fair. there's this like, America is, you know, it doesn't have that kind of lingering responsibility to the Commonwealth. It Mm. is about like new, it is about modernity, it is about excess and independence. And I think these characters, you know, British, you know, really you've got Matt Berry just doing his British accent. And then um, the other two are doing their, um, you know, doing versions of other European accents. So I think it's a very Americanized look at what the quote unquote old world is. Mm-hmm. Where that tension is. And when you actually get over to quote unquote Staten Island, ooh, everything is shiny and new. And actually, I do want that. Actually, I do want to try that. Actually, I do want to consume that. Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of um, American mentality of more, more, more is very much a driver for these characters. And then the show itself works to dismantle that you actually don't get that much out of it. Yes. And it's actually about your close connections that mean something yes perfectly put and i think you know moving it to new york and staten island really does expand the world as well one of the things we talked about with buffy the vampire slayer um a few episodes ago you know buffy was very contained set in the little town of sunnydale and then when we moved to angel in la we got the chance to see more of this world what it looked like how it functioned you know going to different bars and clubs and offices and lawyers and corporations and how it weaves into this world and we get the same thing here i think that we're actually getting to really look into how this world full of vampires and monsters functions from day to day right yeah and i think that's maybe where i I kind of lost a bit of the urge to finish wellington paranormal is that it did feel a bit smaller Mm -hmm. whereas the world and what we do in the shadows feels so much more expansive and i yeah really trust the creative team so much and i know it's a lot of overlap um but i i feel like they've so much more to play with and i'm so much more excited to see where they go doesn't feel as case of the wiki no Um, not at all actually yeah um so i want to like go through some of our favorite episodes and stuff like that because there's so i just there's so, so much many. to there's so many to talk about and i asked i asked you to select some of your favorites and i thought what we could do is maybe kind of briefly talk about sure. this show season by season and talk about where these characters are at uh, and then we can sort of pick a couple of um, episodes from each season as we go, which you've done. So season one, like you said, it I think does a really good job of kind of initially just sort of setting up this world, doesn't it? Like it's got these kind of interesting B plots as well as introducing our group of characters that all live together, introducing what Colin Robinson is and what he brings to it. It also has these kind of B plots where you've got like Beanie Feldstein's character getting turned into a vampire, right, as well. And that is quite a nice way of, I guess, just showing people how a vampire turns in this world and how that happens and this kind of thing. But were you a fan of season one generally and the way this show is set up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think each season is incredibly successful, especially looking back at where they are now in season four. Yeah. You can see, like, you can't get to season where they are in season four without doing all the foundational work that they do in season one. Mm. So I think they're actually like a very disciplined team in terms of world building, which this show really, you know, it needs and it, it's so successful at i agree um, I, it's wonderful i yeah. think it does a really good job of kind of giving you what you know from the film but starting some particular plot arcs and starting to expand the mythology in a way where we want more right um so let's start off as i said i've asked you to select two to three episodes per season um to recommend and talk a little bit about so what's your first season one episode that you want to talk about alex uh so i picked i believe it's episode three uh, where they go to the nightclub oh yeah well i'll tell you something if you want this hat 
You'll have to cut my head off. Laszlo. That's fine. Big Vlad right behind you has a machete. He could take it, or perhaps we could get the silent one. Or little Vlad, he's a fucking maniac. And if we could hit Mr. Pifties, maybe he could help. Or the exsanguinator himself. Or, let's see, fucking everybody here. All right, all right, you've made your point. Get off me. And this is the one with Nick Crow, right, as well? Yes, this is our first introduction to the character. Um, (laughs) And uh, he's... uh, so funny again it's one of our first instances of i think a known comedic actor just kind of popping up Mm -hmm. um and uh is what is his name simon the devious and (laughs) this yeah and this notion of oh oh my god when they go to the club and they're like oh we have to all wear capes everyone's wearing capes like that's the (laughs) club where you go to wear capes and again we understand a bit more of our, um, our lead characters' roles because they have to kind of constantly say like, oh, we're not really in charge of Staten Island. We're in charge of these few blocks. Yes, 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 yes. So it's so good. I love that episode as well. And that is also the introduction of the cursed hat, right? <laughs> that keeps making a return every like every season. <laughs> I know. It's kind of like the Where's Waldo or Where's Wally. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of where it's going to pop up. But no, again, it's, it's it's a great introduction to the bureaucracy of the vampire world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the popular kids versus the unpopular kids. And then we as an audience start to go, okay, well, who are the characters we're following? Yes, exactly. Uh, and that that is not the same one because these have all blurred slightly for me now, but that's not the same one where they take the Baron on a night out. This right? is a, that's yeah, a, that's a separate episode that I also picked from season one. Oh, perfect. There you go. Yeah. Okay. You've picked the nights out, the two nights yes. out. I love it. Okay. Good. <laughs> Maybe it's like, I'm still kind of, you know, grappling with pandemic and, you know, not going out. I'm like, Ooh, people going out, have fun. <laughs> yes. Why would the Baron want to go on a night out? Because he wants to know how much of America we've conquered. And when he finds out that we've just conquered our street and part of Ashley street, he's going to kill us. But if we seriously think he's gonna quick us, which we do, then we should quick him first. You yeah. Ah! yeah, they they encounter their old friend question mark the Baron, mm-hmm. who's played by Doug Jones, pretty wonderfully. Um, a very evil, very old vampire with you know huge powers. And one of the things I really loved about this episode is that it grapples succinctly with the idea that you know in so many films like vampires want to take over the world and they want to rule the humans and they're like yeah that's what the baron wants to do and it just doesn't work for us i what are we gonna do what is that i don't want to do that it's so doug jones is so good obviously you know like a legend in playing monsters and makeup and all of that kind of thing but like his physicality in this his balancing of being quite menacing at times right as well like you feel like this baron could murder any of them at any moment um but then also Again, like he pops up a few times later on down the line and he's so funny and sweet as well. And it's just like, it's such a brilliant balancing act, I think, that that character gets. Oh, totally. And that's where we are, we're also introduced to uh, drug blood. Mm-hmm. Drug blood. Yes, because they yeah. all get really they all high. They get fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, they all get fucked up. I love that. And they all come back and they're crashing into things. And then he is like nearly... B- and then obviously it all ends hilariously spoiler alert with Guillermo accidentally killing him right when he walks yeah. in the next morning and again this introduces this kind of actually like a long running arc uh, of like what happens if you murder another vampire this vampire council have to get involved right and that that has repercussions for them but also it kind of introduces this element of Guillermo being a vampire hunter like an accidental vampire hunter right <laughs> which is so it's good. so good and he's so like <laughs> I love how, I mean, I think I I thought when I was initially watching the series, like, oh, he's going to turn on them and it's going to be, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like, and I love that they haven't done that. Yeah. He's got is. this history for himself. He's got this thing that he's always grappling with and, you know, seemingly accidentally killing vampires, but yeah. um, they're finding ways to make it work. And again, I think that just shows how like the structure of systems and families can always evolve. Agreed. I love it. And, and yeah, you're right. Like it. It, it does a really clever balancing act of, you know, it they, they want to keep Guillermo on, on their side for the show's sake, but also it doesn't feel like 
he keeps kind of I don't know he's not stuck in stasis Guillermo I think no. in that regard you know like he goes on such a journey as well um, yeah I love I love both those picks I also should shout to the episode The Trial in season one as well because I know that one I'd heard about that one as well and I know that one was a bit of a fan favourite but obviously this is the one where the repercussions of what they did killing the Baron they go up against this kind of council of vampires, right? And in that episode, you have all of these amazing cameos from all of these actors that have been in vampire movies. So you've got Tilda Swinton, you've got Evan Rachel Wood, you've also got Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement, right, coming back as their roles from the original film. So that's why we're here. I'll now introduce the leaders of the council, starting here with Tilda, pretty much our leader. She's the one who makes all the big decisions. Welcome, Tilda. I am Viago von Donnerschmarken Schädenheimberg. This is Deacon Brucke. Hello. Vladislav the Poker. We also have Evan, the immortal princess of the undead. You don't have to say my whole name. You can just say Evan. It's fine. Or just Evan. Who else do we have? Danny. Hey, Danny. He's a shirt off as usual. Cool Mexican tattoos all over his chest. Dark greetings, everyone. Welcome, Danny. We also have Paul. Dark greetings, everyone. Dark greetings. And I love that they um, that they pulled um, Paul Rubens as his character from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. Which, yes, spoiler, I greatly prefer to the TV show. I know, um, I know, I love that, and that's quite that almost a, a bit of a deep cut. It feels like right getting Paul Rubens as a vampire. It's so good. And like they're talking about the other people who can't make it. You know, yeah. Rob's trying to move on. <laughs> Kiefer's busy. Brad and Tom. Yeah, no, no, no. We were never going to get them. Um, but like fucking like Tilda Swinton. Amazing. Like I know you guys are talking about um, uh, the only lovers left yes. alive soon. And and I'm so excited for that episode because I love that movie. Oh, so um, good. And it's such a. It, that film has such a funny, amazing, unique tone to it, but she's just going full comedy in this. Yeah. And I love that. Because you I rarely get to see that from her. I, I was just about to say that. Like you, she's she's so known for these quite sort of intense performances, and it's just it was so much fun to see her just having fun with this. Um yeah, loved it. And again, it kind of introduced this idea that because I, I don't think until this point I knew whether or not it was set in the same world as mm. the original film, right? Until now we actually see those characters and where they're at next kind of thing. So it's really nice to kind of, again, it it's really kind of expanding on that world in a really interesting way. Do you do you have any like cameos you're hopeful for in the series? Because <gasps> I have one. I don't know. What which what which one are you hoping for? I mean, I was literally like all of season four, I was like, is Steven Dorf gonna show up? <laughs> Cause I know they've got Deacon like from the film and he's in this world too, but I was like, Steven Dorf. Yeah, he, he would, come on. He would do it too, right? What else is he yeah. doing? And I love Steven Dorf. What else is he doing? What else is he doing? I mean, I want I would have thought they would have asked him too, maybe for but but then maybe because we've already got the character of the deacon, but that in itself could be quite fun if you have them both. But again, but yeah. like you've got Blade in the trial, and then in season four, as we've talked about, Nadia's opening the Blood Rave Club. <laughs> yes. So there's like we're all they're playing fast and loose with the mythologies, I think. And I just I would just love that because they also have what's the other guy from blade oh yes the, the, the guy, guy that plays is it the guy that plays whistler in blade no 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 he's like he is a steven dorf deacon frost like right hand man oh, who gets his yeah. own hand chopped yeah, off yeah, yeah 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 he shows up for like at least an episode or two that's right he does yeah that's yeah, right yeah. yeah again there's so many bits to this show this is this is why tv shows are tricky to do on podcasts it's like oh it's ridiculous i know it's <laughs> ridiculous but yeah I, I i would like to see Kiefer sutherland that would be fun right let's get Kiefer. Mm. that'd be good um yeah so there you go so season two then how do you think generally that compared to season one? Because season two is when things start to kind of grow, I suppose, right? And these kind of slightly more long running narratives kind of come into play as well. Yeah, it's it's they got, they've built the foundations of the house and now they're like decorating. Yeah. And now they're really playing with it and starting to do some, you know, pretty big things. Yeah. I, I mean, we'll talk about a few of them, obviously, but I think this is where it begins to take some leaps and it they start to see that through viewership and the audience response to it, mm -hmm. um, that it's growing. And that I think for me, it certainly became more, I became more aware of the show in season two yeah. because it wasn't just doing what the film did. It was like, no, we're going to blow some shit out of the water and take some big risks. Yeah. It's so good, isn't it? And you've got, 
the Guillermo's um, arc starting to grow in season two when he saw, he discovers at the end of season one, right, that he's a descendant of Van Helsing. And then he meets those like vampire hunters. He kind of accidentally joins this group of vampire hunters, right? So you've got him doing really interesting things. You've got this Collins promotion episode, which we've already talked about. And you feel like you're kind of getting to know the kind of the lore and the mythology of these characters and the histories of these characters a little bit more um, by season two which I really enjoyed Um, so what are the episodes what are some of your fave episodes from season two Um, so one of the ones I picked was Brain Scramblies which I believe is episode three that is one of my favourites so good you see there's various levels of overhypnosis if it's not too serious it's what's called weak brain if it's slightly worrying it's called thoughtless sallies and if it's a fucking nightmare and you can forget about him it's brain scramblies it starts with superb owl (laughs) It goes to a weird Ocean's 12 obsession and then a man falling in love with his wife all over again. Yeah, the the superb owl is obviously they've been invited to a Super Bowl party, right? And they mistake it for being about superb owls. And there's this, again this like brilliant and sweet relationship with their neighbour. Um, what's his name? That neighbour? I've forgotten his is name. Is it Sean? Sean, yeah. And, and it's particularly Laszlo who really kind of has yes. this affection for Sean, right? This friendship. And they all go to his for the for the Super Bowl, accidentally hypnotize him too much, where they give him, like you say, the brain scramblies, right? And then have to kind of try and fix him as best they can. It's so good. <laughs> Nando wants to kill Sean because he's got the brain scramblies. Well, then Nando is correct. Have you gone soft, my sweet syrup pie? No, my sweet syrup pie. I've gone hard because he's my best friend. He's my pal. He's my homeboy, my rotten soldier. He's my sweet cheese. My good time boy. It's so good. And I think, again, like so many great comedy beats of like, they actually really like the neighbor. Yes. They actually want to engage with them. <laughs> yeah. um, and they're really and then excited well, to be invited, right? As well, it's so sweet. Oh my God. <laughs> Nadia's excitement at getting to meet a superb owl. Yeah. Like, do I get to touch it? Will it like, oh, like she's so excited. It's It's so like odd and you're just like this is just wonderful i I want to meet a superb owl now i do as well yeah there are i mean and there are so many i'm just looking at the list of episodes in season two but there are so many bangers in this particular season but which what was your other episode that you've picked i I don't think we could have talked about this show without like talking a bit more about um on the run yes where um uh, Laszlo uh, must flee because mark hamill is after him (laughs) and he uh, disguises himself as regular uh, human bartender Jackie Daytona from Arizona. After all that nonsense on Staten Island, I cut loose to Pennsylvania because it sounded like Transylvania. And we all know that sounds cool. I infiltrated the township posing as your average American Yankee doodle dandy. And I took over Lucky Brew's Bar and Grill. The previous owner, he mysteriously disappeared because I killed him. Drinks on the house! And I've not looked back since. I now go by the name of Detona, Jackie Detona. And I'll tell you something, Jackie Detona's life, it ain't so bad. Not bad at all. Jackie Daytona. Do you think he'll come back? I feel like Jackie Do- Daytona will come back at some point. <laughs> oh, I think that's tricky because so many people love that episode. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That if they were going to do it again, it would have to, like, hit it out of the park. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Maybe it's best left alone. Um, that is a lovely episode, and you've already talked about it briefly, but, like, it takes us out of the main kind of story and location, and we go off on this little road trip with Laszlo, and he just gets to do some really fun stuff in that episode as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then they both, like, both of the vampires become, like, deeply involved in volleyball and, <laughs> like, great. I love it. I love it. Sometimes, like, it's, sometimes I feel like with comedy that kind of does that, it might feel like a bit like they're, you know, doing Mad Libs, mm-hmm. like they're making it up as they go. But there's a commitment to the bit each yes. and every time yep. that it's like they land it that yeah. I think is so impressive. I love um, I love the first couple of episodes of season two. The first one where we've got Haley Joel Osman's character, right? Getting yes. hired as a familiar. 
and the, the, then they keep killing him and they have to resurrect him and Guillermo just accidentally continuously killing all of these vampires love that episode I also love ghosts as well where they all meet their own ghost versions of themselves and then that's when we get introduced to the Nadia doll right as well because yes. the ghost possesses that doll and she just sticks around for the rest of the show yeah. amazing <laughs> just hanging out she just comes and like she'll either be like a main part of the plot occasionally yeah. but it'll just be like a like just a little comic punchline here and there so too good. right so good and then of course again like i have to just mention it again because i loved it so much but colin's promotion um when he is promoted to manager of his office which means that everybody has no choice but to listen to his bullshit and he's just like overflowing with you know feeding on people and he's i mean who can't relate to that <laughs> yeah he's who can't I, I mean i mean the like having a boss like that not hopefully not being that absolutely boss. no it's so true like the people that have to act like they're really they like they laugh along at his bad jokes when he gives a powerpoint presentation and like it's so good it's giving him so much that he starts like growing hair and floating and then he eventually like yeah there's he like triples i'm changing i'm becoming something new something stronger i don't even need to talk someone's ear off anymore to drain them i can drain them with a single phrase it's so good like that episode was an absolute favorite of mine as well absolutely loved it um, and the last episode too, which is where they get invited to the theatre, right? This, this kind of yes. Grand Guignol theatre and it all ends up being a trap because they're actually going to be captured and executed for all of the vampires that they've killed. So again, this kind of ongoing arc, right, of like the consequences of their actions earlier on in the season kind of catch up with them at this point as well. But I loved all of that. That was great. Yeah, it's just, it's so strong. And again, like each character gets their own you know, beats and episodes within seasons, but yet it still, as to your point, has that big narrative arc, yeah. which is so great. So clever. And then season three, I think this might be my favorite, but season three is when a lot of the, the action shifts because they actually get given a job, right? On the yes. Vampire Council, particularly um, Nandor and Nadia, right? They have to kind of run it together. So a lot of the, like the locations, we're kind of going back and forth between the main house and then also this this kind of underground, building that belongs to them and in that there's these like giant libraries and there's all these kind of hidden doors with different creatures and different artifacts and vampire things so it kind of again it opens up to all of these fun new possibilities I think in this season and I think that's like a real strength of the show is that it keeps each season and they're short seasons like comparatively for other American series um that they keep making some big jumps each season in terms of the world and the scope. Yeah. And I always think like if, you know, just to compare it to the American office for a second, yeah. like they only started to make big jumps later on. Yes. Yeah. And I love a lot of the seasons and even the later seasons I rewatched not that long ago. And I was like, they aren't as bad as I remember. Uh, but it feels like when you're trying to take these big leaps at the end, it's not like as an audience member, I'm not built into this world of like each season, we're going to up our game. Yeah. We're going to up our game in an unexpected way. And um, I, I think that's, it's so smart yeah. of the, 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 creators and the, the whole team behind the show agreed like they keep coming up with ways to make it fresh um so yeah what 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 of faves have you picked from season three Gosh, I, I mean, again it's so hard because i just want to disclaimer like i love all of them so yeah um but i had to start with uh casino oh that's the that's is that the atlantic city one i oh, sorry. Yeah, that's when they go to Atlantic oh, City and it's so uh, Sean and his wife's um, vow renewal. Are you playing a game called the Big Bang Theory game? So hypnotic. It has me in its grips. Ah. Two Leonard's in a rage. I need three rages! Again. I won! Bazinga! And, and like they lose their homeland dirt under their beds and it got vacuumed up so Guillermo's got to go on a whole thing that little montage of him going to like Greece and London like it's so good <laughs> I love that episode so much and uh, them having to like pull a kind of Ocean's Eleven in order to get Sean the money that he needs and everything it's so sweet and again it just that perfect point skip ahead 30 seconds if you haven't watched the episode but where you're like watching you're going 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 and then it, like the punchline is the boxer getting his head punched off <laughs> yeah. like I was like I wasn't laughing because my mouth was like a gate yes 
yes, it's genius. Like I loved, and um, Nadia who remembers hanging out with the Rat Pack and oh, then yes. thinks that they're still around when she sees a tribute act. Like it's that episode is just chock full of amazing moments, isn't it? Like getting so excited good. when they say "ring a ding ding." <laughs> it, again, that like it's it's earnest in a way that vampires are in the genre, yes. but just twisting it. So it's like she's excited about fake Rat Pack. I love it. I, it's such a good episode. And then what's your other pick? Oh, it, uh, my other pick for the season was Wellness Center, oh, yeah. where Nandor has to go and uh, well, he, uh, Nandor is so depressed and he's you know trying to do all this stuff and he goes to collect fees for the vampire council and he gets sucked into a vampire cult where they pretend to be humans. So good. I forgot how exciting it was to live like a human. So much fun. I absolutely love that episode. And I want to shout, I think my favourite might be right near the beginning of the season, um, the cloak of duplication. <laughs> When, yes. when one of the things that they find when they go and work at this council is this cloak that means you can transform into anyone else, basically. And uh, Nandor decides he wants, I think, Laszlo initially to pretend to be him so that he can chat up a woman. And then that goes wrong and everyone each has a go at at being Nandor, right, in this sequence. And it it gives um, it gives Cave and Novak this amazing, like, chance to basically be all of the other characters like he puts on the voice because when I first watched it I was like surely that's not him doing the voices right and I think for most of them it is it's actually him doing like impressions of Colin and Laszlo and everyone else it's so good she's angry as women so often are please good lady I know I came here earlier but whatever I said and I don't remember I wasn't myself well you started by calling me dipshit so proof of naught but mine own delirium you, my darling, have the high, firm ass of an Irish Derby winner. That's what I read. I read it after, you know, well after I saw the episode, and I was blown away because I was like, "Wow, that's really impressive to sync audio that well." Because it's not easy. <laughs> and then I was like, uh, "Oh, you just hire really talented actors. Yeah, that's how you do that." You really got wow. like that was real like Kay Van Novak's episode to shine, as well as the Wellness Center. To be fair, like he gets yeah. to do some really brilliant stuff in this season yeah and also there is this kind of other sort of b-plot running throughout where laszlo and colin robinson are kind of bonding together right there's like they fixing <laughs> yes. up a car together or they go on a little trip there's the sirens that they he has to go and rescue colin from and everything as well which i love and there and then this kind of twist at the end that it's all because laszlo has found out that colin is gonna die right and then this like shock colin robinson death that we get at the end of the season i was not expecting that i was not expecting that that. And then when he kind of emerges again as a baby, I, I was like, this won't work. This no. is jumping the shark. This is weird. I don't because I wasn't smart enough to trust the creators to turn out some of my favorite episodes based on baby Colin Robinson. Right, exactly. Which we should get to next because I was genuinely shocked and upset when Colin Robinson suddenly <laughs> died. I thought they're not actually going to kill him off. And then there was that moment I just gasped when they like... They like went to knock him on his head and it, his face just like caves in because yes. he's dead. And you're like, oh, fuck, he's actually gone. And then, like you say, you get this weird moment when this sort of thing, this parasite like crawls out of him and it's like, this weird newborn baby Colin. And yeah, I did think, and it took me a couple of episodes to get into this, but I did think at the beginning of season four, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is working with baby Colin Robinson, but it definitely won me over by the end yeah um so yeah let's talk about finally let's talk about season four so we've got baby colin robinson we've got Nadja who has transformed the the building what's the like the sort of council into a nightclub she's become obsessed with opening her own nightclub right in this season so a yeah. lot of season four is focused on Nadja's nightclub as well which is great fun yeah and then you know the utilization of colin robinson is like the main headlining act and a great kind of conversation about like how child stars are used and like the weird creepiness of it like so smart it's so good because they're like oh it's not colin robinson it's the thing that emerged from colin robinson yes but he has these Colin Robinson's ways about him where Laszlo wants to raise him and be into like kind of high culture and all this stuff. But actually, he's obsessed with musical theatre, right? And Stephen Sondheim and he goes off on all these monologues about musical theatre. And you could just see everyone start to glaze over again straight away. I mean, and when I started, uh, when I saw the friends who encouraged me to, to 
you know, get back into the show yeah. and, and really give it full go. I, I saw them over the summer and they were like, oh, have you gotten to the private school episode yet? And I was like, no, I haven't. I, I think it's coming up. And they were like, it's a good one. Yes. As you can see, we're Colleen's two dads. Wonderful. You know, our school is quite proud of our acceptance of family structures that at one time... Yeah, like, can I stop you there? You need to know that we're very gay for each other. Completely gay. We are like two French trombones. And this guy? I ream him nightly. And I'm always sucking him off. And they are like, come, it's dinner. Stop sucking off your gay husband. Yeah, which is amusing, because I am at dinner. And I just carry on reaming him. Sexually, you must understand that. <laughs> it's basically just the whole episode, right? Of the vampires trying to pose as the perfect type of parents in order to get their kid enrolled into a private school. So they try being gay parents or they try being, you know, whatever. And it they have to keep resetting the scenario and rehypnotizing this man that's come to interview them, right? And it is again, it's very simple. It's almost entirely set in one room and it's just Genius. I, I, it's funny because I wa- I rewatched it again this week and loved it, and I was like, oh, so perfect. Um, and then I was at a friend of a friend's house on uh, a few days ago when we had a glass of wine and we were going out to a concert, and they had two kids in the house, mm-hmm. I think like six and five, and they were just running around screaming. We, uh, my friend and I, went outside for a second. We came back in, and one of them had managed to chop the other half's the other one's hair half off. What? And I was just like, oh my God, it's two baby Colin Robinsons. <laughs> oh no. Oh my God. It was why I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in this kid's business because <laughs> it's real. Um, oh, it's but so like good. that whole, like trying to sell the child as a certain thing yes. in a certain way. And then, you know, the, the guy, um, I was brought in by Sean, the neighbor, uh, to interview them for a uh, local private school. And they keep, they haven't figured out their human stories yet. Yes. Uh, so they have, Nadia has to keep hypnotizing them. And they basically go through every single formation of a family that they can come up with, with all the people in the room. Mm-hmm. And it is uh, one of my favorite montages ever. Oh, so good. In my life that I have seen. It's so good. Yeah. And they give this poor guy, given the interviews, he gets the brain scramblies by the end as well, doesn't he? Basically. Or does he yeah, die? Yeah, and then he Maybe dies. He died. Yeah, he died. Yeah, they were like, he didn't get in because he died <laughs> on the way back. <laughs> He had a massive, like, brain hemorrhage. I loved that one so much. I also loved, I mean, like, I could name all of these ones, actually, but I loved the night market when they go to the night market and there's that where the familiars are being made to fight each other to the death. That's an amazing one. Love that. I loved, obviously, you've got uh, Nandor's whole arc in this is where he's being granted wishes and he brings back his wives and he wants to get married and you've got all of that, which is like really, really fun. Uh, yeah, there's there's so much good stuff in this season. And then the other episode you picked, right, is Go Flip Yourself. Yeah. Yes. I'm Bran Daltrey. And I'm Toby Daltrey. And we're the, the Daltrey Brothers. And this is Go Flip Yourself. Wow. Like, if like that, I think, is the most high concept of any episode of that we've seen so far. Yes. Um, it was such a big um, reach. It was such a big jump mm-hmm. to do it. Um, I thought they did it really well. I don't know if it totally worked logically, but I didn't care because I was having so much fun with it. Yeah. And I think like any good parody or satire when you watch it, it tells you things about the content that it's satirizing. Yes, yes. And you learn, like, again, like all of these, like, you know, home improvement shows and, you know, all of that. It's so spot on with those mm-hmm. um, that you actually start to see, I think, a bit more about, um, you know, all of their tropes and the stuff that they're indebted to. I love it. And there you go. And then, so... We end up at the end of season four, right, with uh, Colin Robinson back, like he's become full Colin Robinson again by the end, and Guillermo potentially being turned into a vampire, right? That's sort of where we're left at the end of season four with that cliffhanger. Um, What are your your hopes for the future of what we do in The Shadows? Like, how long do you want this show to go on for? Is there anything that you particularly want to see from this show and these characters? I think it'll be interesting to see if they pay off the Guillermo. Mm. Um, um, mm-hmm. element because that's been such a strong through line between all of the seasons yeah. of him, 
you know, obviously having a relationship with Nandor and caring about him, you know, as a friend or boss or whatever. But then, you know, you always promised me this. You always promised me this. Mm. So what happens? Like, you know, it's like Jim and Pam get together. Yeah. What happens? What happens next? You know, yeah. and I, I mean, I feel like I've watched enough of it to know I should never try to, you know, anticipate what they're going to do and just enjoy the ride. Yeah. Um, but I'll be interested to see how and if it changes, if they actually give in. I, I, my instinct is that I think they will make Guillermo a vampire. Yeah, um, I think so. Because I, they're not ones to tease. No. Like, I think they're they're happier to pay it off and play and, and find something else to explore. So Yeah, totally. Like, like with Colin Robinson, they're clearly not afraid to take risks and just completely change things up and see where it goes, right, as well. And I love that. And obviously the nightclub is kind of done, I think, after season four, right? Yeah. It feels like that little arc is ended as well. So yeah, I can't I can't wait to see where this is going to go. I don't know how long this show is going to run for. When you look it up on IMDb, it says that there are six, there are going to be six seasons. I don't know if that's just the case at the moment or if they plan to stop at six maybe, but you know. I know they're shooting season five right now. Yeah. I think they're almost wrapped. I love it. Well, there you go. Well, my final impossible questions that you won't be able to answer, but like if you had to pick just one episode, what's your favorite episode? <laughs> God damn you, Mike. <laughs> I think I'm going to say private school. Oh yeah, it's so good, isn't it? It's it, it so has good. all of the elements I like. It it just mm -hmm. yeah, and I think it's it's very um, it's not as high concept or as big of a swing as as a lot of others that we've talked about, uh, but I think it's so true to the spirit of the show and um, absolutely ridiculous and lovely. Agreed, it's so good. I would maybe go with the casino episode, the Atlantic mm. City one. I think that might be up there for me as my favorite um, and favorite character. <laughs> if you had to pick one, probably Nadja. Yeah. She's so good. I love them all, but I, I just always get very excited for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I think it would be Laszlo for me, but it's kind of Laszlo Naja together as a couple. Like yeah. The two of them, I just love them both so much. They're so, so good. Um, amazing. And then final question, off of what we do in the shadows momentarily, but just to finish, what's your favorite vampire movie, Alex? Um, oh, <laughs> I have, you said, I think in your questions, you said favorites. Yeah. Oh, so they could I be favorites. Multiple. Absolutely. I can have multiple? Yeah. You're not going to boot me off? I'll, right. I'll try not to. No. <laughs> All right. I wrote down a few because, again, it's such a wide ranging genre. But yeah, yeah. I put in um, Abel Ferreira's The Addiction from 1995, mm. um, uh, Near Dark, which you've already touched on, yeah. uh, Let the Right One In, oh. um, Fright Night and The Lost Boys. Amazing. Amazing choices. Yeah. I love it. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Like, it's always really difficult to navigate talking about TV shows and it's always a bit kind of like sprawling <laughs> and meandering. But I think we got, we covered quite a lot of ground there. So thank you so oh, much. I mean, thanks for coming on this journey with me. Yeah, no, have me back on to talk anytime about TV as long as it's one of my favorite TV shows. Yeah, yeah. As long, so, so you're going to come back for our Real Housewives special at some point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah no, me, <laughs> Stacey and Anthony will yeah. do like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I would listen to that. Um, brilliant. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Um, and um, just remind people, like, is there anything you can tell us about what you've got coming up on Faculty of Horror that people should be listening out for yet or anything like that? Oh, sure. Um, uh, December 2022 is our uh, 10 year anniversary. So we were doing a really fun live show here in Toronto for that. So cool. that should be out soon, if not already by the time you're listening to it. And then I do have some other things in the works, mm -hmm. but I can't announce them quite yet. Mm -hmm. They'll be announced this month. Um, so, yeah. If Twitter is still a thing when you're listening to it, you can follow me there at Scare Alex. If not, you can follow me on Instagram, which is at Scare underscore Alex. Um, yeah. Who knows? Amazing. Time is weird. Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, amazing. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And a huge thank you to my brilliant guest, Alex West. It's always a genuine honor to have Alex on the podcast. So I'm so grateful for her time. So what did you think of this week's episode? What do you think of what we do in the shadows? Do you love it as much as Alex and I? Did we miss talking about any of your favorite episodes? Please do get in touch and let me know. You can email me evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this episode with fellow listeners, you can join the Evolution of Horror Discord, or you can sign up to the Evolution of Horror discussion group. That can be found on Facebook. You can find this podcast 
podcast in all the usual podcast platforms. And if you get a spare moment, I'd be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts, as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners. So on to next week then, and we are nearly at the end of our journey. All that's left to do is mop up a few additional titles that we haven't yet discussed this series. So as ever, next week, I am going to be joined by Brad Hansen for a Vampire Also Rans. We are not going to be talking about anything in spoilerific detail. We are just going to be giving you short, fast, spoiler-free recommendations for a whole bunch of additional vampire movies and TV shows that we didn't get a chance to discuss in this series. Thank you so much for listening and join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror.